Uh, now, of course, this is a first for me here in this church, is uh, actually preaching something, and um, I find it a little daunting because giving a testimony, you can't really get that wrong, can you, unless you sort of forget what your life is because, you know, you just tell it as it is. It's your story. But uh, when you're preaching, you've actually got to get things right. And um, so uh, we'll see how I go. And if you think I'm wrong, you can correct me afterwards. How's that? <laughs> I, uh, last week, a, a lot of you would have known that I had a, a quite stressful last week, and anybody who wants to know the details of that, I'm quite happy to share afterwards. But it, um, it uh, you know, whenever we come to hard times, I think it tends to bring us back to focus on, on God. And, um, you know, if you... If you if you get to a point of crisis, there is only sort of one place to turn, isn't there, when, as Christians? And so I'm going to start by reading quite a, quite a hefty passage of Scripture, actually. And um, it starts with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It um, starts Matthew 26, 36 is where I'm starting from. And um, I'd, like to, I'd like you to think about a time in your life, and most of us have, have had one, where you've had to face something that you don't want to face, whether it is surgery, like, you know, we've talked this morning about people who's going, you know, or bankruptcy or war or whatever it is that's in, in your life, something where you could, you could identify with Jesus where he says, if this cup be taken from, you know, if, if this cup can be taken from me, Please take it from me, but nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. And um, and I think before we before I read it, one of the things that is generally accepted among the Christians that I talk to is that Je one of Jesus' roles when he was here on earth was to present us with a role model. You know, I don't think there's anything that Jesus ever did that wouldn't be right for us to sort of emulate and try to be more like him in and I've never actually applied that myself to his role the role that he showed us in the garden of Gethsemane and he's on his way up to the cross and we're seeing just a minute ago about building a people of power and you know build your church Lord and make us strong you know but where does the Bible the Bible tells us you know when's God strong it's in it's in when in when we're weak, isn't it? It's in our in our weakness that God's strength can come through. And you know, I'll read this passage in a minute, but I think most of us know it enough that I can refer to it as, you know, Jesus has given us a role model here of, you know, allowing God to be strong when He's about to show voluntarily, by the way, His His weakness. And uh, you know, I think. I think that's an amazing, an amazing um, role model. Now, the other thing I've picked up from watching other people is when you're speaking, you're never a good speaker unless you've got a glass of water on the floor behind you, <laughs> which you continually turn around and pick up and take a sip from. Huh? So maybe I've got that bit right. Um, now, so I'm going to read Matthew, th and of course... Gethsemane is in all the, the Gospels, but I'm, I'm going to read the, the Matthew version. It's, it's quite a long piece, but have in mind the role model that, that he was giving us in, in this. And I've got a Bible here. It's got four different translations, which I, I, really, I really value that because you can, it's got, you know, you can cross-reference and, and see what other translations say. I've got the New International Version I'm reading for today. Yeah. So then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And if you're thinking about the times in your life when you can identify with that, you know, you can, you can, you can, you know what it means. Something of what it means to be overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. 
Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray, so you will not fall in temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And he went away a second time and prayed. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away from me unless I drink it, then may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And so he left them and he went away once more and prayed for the third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And while he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him. It was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs and sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And I'll just, I'll break in there just, you know, not only is he, is he sorrowful to the point of, of death, not only is he, is he going to face something he doesn't want to face, trusting the will of the Father, but he's going there at the hands of a betrayer. You know, and and think about the justice of that. You know, going there on the testimony of of one of his mates who was in his circle, basically, and the betrayer had arranged a signal with them: the one I kiss is the man, is, is this man, and, and arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas says, "Greetings, Rabbi," and he kissed him. And Jesus replied, "Friend, what do you come from? What do you come for?" Then the men stepped forward and seized Jesus and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword and he drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? And at, and at that time Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I've sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might fulfill, be fulfilled. And then all the disciples deserted him and fled. You know? He's by himself, isn't he? <laughs> you know, been betrayed by his mates, facing this worst ever thing, you know, and whatever you've thought of to identify, worse than that. And nobody's sticking by him. They fell asleep and then they deserted him. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Cyphus and the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and he sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole of the Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. Didn't, didn't defend himself. You know? And that amazes me. <laughs> you know? he, didn't, he didn't say, hang on a minute, I'm doing this because I've got to fulfill prophecy. Hang on a minute, I've got to do this because I've got to save the world. <laughs> you know? He was silent before his accusers. And the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? Is he worthy of death? And they... 
he is worthy of death, they answered. And they spit on his face, and they struck him with their fists, and others slapped him, and they said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the bit of Pilate. I think most of us know the story enough that, to know of, of Judas, had what Judas did with himself in the end, and then, you know... Jesus and Barabbas and the soldiers mocking him. And I'll go to 27, 13, 32, sorry. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon. They forced him to carry the cross and they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross, if you are the Son of God. Yeah. And he didn't come down from the cross, did he? <laughs> he, uh, he accepted those insults. Didn't, didn't stand up. And I mean, I don't know, it makes me think, you know, if someone insults me, my first reaction is to put them right. You know? And he's uh, hanging on the cross and people were insulting him and he could call on legions and he just accepted the insults. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, sorry, in the same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. If He says he's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants for he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him were also heaped on it with insults. Yeah. Now, they said they'd believe him if he came down from the cross. Why didn't he come down from the cross? And I think, it, partly, there's a lot of things. He's, he's, he's showing us, you know, he's, he's a role model, you know. How are we to follow him in this? Do we have to defend ourselves? Do we rely on God's purpose for our lives and purpose for any suffering that we may have to face you know and when we say you know, may this cup be taken from us but your will be done do we mean it <laughs> do we mean can you do our will please from the sixth hour until the ninth hour darkness came over all the land about the ninth hour Jesus cried out in a loud voice Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani which means my God my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, and I just, and I just, I mean, how can we really identify with that? You know, being separated from from God, taking on all these insults, taking on these false accusations, and being motivated by love for us to do this. When some who were standing there and heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge and he filled it with wine and, vin uh, vi wine and vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone and let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Now, you know, I don't know what you were... You know, what thing you might have pictured in your life that you didn't want to face. Or, you know, or what you might have prayed. You know, Father, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, if your will be done, you know, not my will be done, but your will be done, you know. And I think that... Um, I'll just do my little preachy bit here. And 
And I don't know about you, but I think that when I pray, when I'm in any situations, and for me there's been a few times in my life to greater or lesser extents that I've prayed similar prayers, and I think most most mature people would have, have come across some of these challenges. And There's been times in my life when I have prayed, God, I don't want to do this. But nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. But really what I'm expecting is that God will be nice and give me what I want, you know. And if we are truly his servants, and does the Bible not say, you know, that uh, if you're going to share in his glory, you're going to share in his sufferings, you know, and yet we we balk at anything that is anything like suffering. And I'm not saying it's not wrong to try and pray, <laughs> you know, to pray that relieve us from these sufferings or, uh, you know, but uh, Job went through a whole heap, didn't he? But he had his mates sat around there. With him. I think it was seven weeks or something. He had, he had constantly had his mates around there. And yet Jesus in the garden, they fell asleep. They deserted him. One of his mates actually betrayed him. And I think that, you know, that's probably the, for me, that's the, the ultimate example of, of his strength and how the strength as we see it, is not the strength as he sees it. He's seeing it in demonstrating and role modelling weakness and trusting God and motives, the motive that is love. You know? And when we sing this song, you know, building a people of power, build your church, Lord, and make us strong, I often have in my mind these, you know, a big, happy, clappy church that's getting people in and, you know, not necessarily wrongly, but what, what if... You know, we are called to share in his suffering in order that we can sh share in his glory. That a strong church is actually a church that's got weak people in it with a strong faith, you know. Or even more correctly, probably, a small faith in a strong God. Because a small bit of faith, you know, faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains, he said. It's not actually the strength of our faith that gets anything done. It's, it's the strength of God. It's not our strength that gets anything done. It's, it's our weakness. And, you know, I'm, I'm guilty when I pray these pr prayers. Take this cup from me, but nevertheless, your will be done. My heart really means, please do my will, God. And so following on from that, you know, if we pray, your will be done, Lord, and not mine, and then his will is done, and it's not what we want. <laughs> you know, if we go, if we go to hospital and we're not healed, if we, you know, if we go to a f um, bankruptcy thing and we can't find a way, you know, whatever these things are, if if our will is not done, but his is, do we then get bitter and angry? You know. Because don't we expect God to save us from these things, you know, and do what is nice for us? Proverbs 16.32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit is better than he that taketh the city. And to me that's talking about inner things, you know. It's talking about... Ephesians tells us we, we don't we don't actually have if we if we're living as true Christians we don't actually have anybody any one person on this earth who who is our enemy we don't you know our enemies are not flesh and blood people principalities and powers the rulers of the current darkness it's spiritual enemies and um, Jesus' death Jesus' role model on the way to his to to this crucifixion was actually not a battle against Rome. I mean, he could have, you know, wasn't a battle against the physical people who tortured him. It was a battle in the spiritual against the principalities and power, and he won it. You know, he faced all evil. He faced the voluntarily faced the the consequences of our sin. You know, and just think about it. 
you know, I, I've, it's no secret I've been in court this week and I'm not going to give any details of that, but what I can say from here is, even here on this earth, when you go into a court and that magistrate walks out with the full authority of the Commonwealth of Australia, nobody's laughing, you know, and you've got tough lawyers who are giggling and carrying on outside and they, you know, they bow down and they say, sorry, Your Honour, and thank you, Your Honour, and, you know, and that's here on earth. Now, when we face the eternal judge, you know, you know, I know who I want as my lawyer, <laughs> because there isn't anything against me, because Jesus has taken everything that's against me, and this, and this role model, this that he's 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 led us into here, that he's led us through this thing, is showing how he's done that. He hasn't done it by fighting with the flesh and blood. He's done it with love and he's done it by giving and self-sacrifice and he's done it by accepting the will of the father not by pursuing his own will and what amazes me is that in Jesus we have the only person who ever lived who had nothing that could be put against him and yet he's allowed himself to stand in our place and accept all that we should cop. You know? Not just in terms of, you know, death, but, I mean, he was spat upon. He took the shame. Here's the Son of God who has all glory and power, and he took shame for us. You know, he allowed himself to be shamed and put down. Didn't stand up in court and say... Hang on, I'm God. Shut up. He just stood there and took it. And and how often do we feel we have to defend ourselves and justify ourselves and say, hang on, hang on a minute, I'm not wrong on this. I'm right on this. Drink break. I'll just... Just a little, um, how am I going? Oh, I think I've done 22 minutes. That gives me another few, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> one of the things in one of the other Gospels, I think it's Mark. I won't look it up, but you'll probably, you can go and find it if you like. One of the other Gospels, it says that during that time in Gethsemane, um, an angel came to Jesus and, and, and um, encouraged him. Does anybody else remember that? It's not just me making it up, is it? Somebody remember that? I'm pretty sure it's there. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and I don't know about your experiences of of um, dealing with the kind of things we're talking about, but I've found the Bible says, you know, that we'll never give any, be given any more that we can cope with. I don't think that's talking about our strength that we can cope with. It's talking about the strength that. God provides us in these situations. And I think, you know, this angel was sent to give encouragement to Jesus. Now, a little thing happened to me the other week when I was facing a, you know, a, a similar thing, not wanting to do something saying God's will be done. And um, I don't know if anyone, people will be familiar with Mel Garvin, who's, who um, brought, was a broadcaster and led Fusion and, and a few weeks ago, about three weeks ago, I, w I had him on my mind for several days and I was praying for him. And um, and uh, I got hold of him on f Facebook and I had a few little things of encouragement to say to him. And then I needed to stay in Hobart for a few days last week. And I, I got hold of him on email. I tried to get hold of him in email to ask if I could stay with him and he never, well, other didn't get the email, didn't reply to me. So I just, I made other arrangements, which were fine. God provided for me in that. But I was on my way down to Hobart and um, I was feeling tired and dizzy and I had to try and get there before the close of business and I thought, no, this is dangerous. So I pulled over and fell asleep. Just, you know, I didn't really intend to fall asleep. Fell asleep there on the side of the road. A truck came past 40 minutes later and I woke up and I thought, oh, too late now. I can't get down there now. 
So I potted down slowly and I went into Northgate to buy some things I needed there. And I turned around at the counter and you know who was standing behind me? Mel Garvin was standing behind me. <laughs> yeah. And I said, Gee, it's good to see you, Mel. <laughs> and we sat down and we had a, a little bit of a talk. And uh, and uh, he gave me a couple of scriptures. One of them's been really... Uh, one of them's uh, Proverbs 17, 17, which uh, I don't know if I can remember it, but it's about... Uh, let me just look it up. About brothers being in the time of need. And here it is. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. And I thought, you know, I've had so many brothers and sisters this week praying for me and sticking by me in, in, in these times. And that was a good one. The other one that he, he reminded me of was, um, it was another proverb, I think it's 3.6, three which is, I can quote it to you off the top of my head. Let me see if I've got it right. It's the one, you know, um, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your way, here it is. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. So that's three, Proverbs three, five, and six. That's probably one that's pretty familiar to a lot of anybody who's read the Bible, or you know, if it's not, read it a bit more. <laughs> one of those ones that sort of, for me, has stuck in my head, but was very powerful in this time, you know. And like Jesus, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what Jesus knew about what was coming or what not. I know he, he had, you know, he was fully man, and so I don't know. But was it not in the garden that he demonstrated this? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. You know? That doesn't, you know, that sort of follows on from the prayer. If this cup be taken from me, please take it away. But your will but be done, not mine. And then you follow on with trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make straight your paths. So if you don't get what you want, but you get what God wants, you know, if what God wants comes to you, and if that is suffering, or hardship, trust in the Lord with all your heart. If you don't get it, you know, while you're in hospital or in jail or whatever it is, you know, don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him. You know, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. And to me, that means, and there's another bit in the Bible, isn't there, that says, give thanks in all circumstances or something like that. Give thanks at all times. And I can't quote it exactly, but it would be familiar to many of you. And it's a similar thing, you know, giving thanks and acknowledging him is a heart attitude. It's an attitude that says, I can't, even if I can't see what you're doing at the moment, I trust you, Lord, and he will make straight your paths. Now, I'm just... Bruce got me onto these daily bread things I don't know if anybody our daily bread I'd heard about them before but he had a whole heap of them and, and give them to me and, and I don't read them by the day I read them by the number of times I go to the toilet but you know, I sit down on the floor and they <laughs> or the, the, the particular one that sits in but this is this is from this is one that's uh, um, I'll read this little one to you it's actually Philip Yancey wrote this one I've learned much about the conscious remembrance of God from Brother Lawrence a cook in the 17th century monastery. In his book, The Practice of the Presence of God, Brother Lawrence mentioned practical ways to offer God your heart from time to time in the course of the day, even in the midst of chores such as cooking or repairing shoes. Once One's depth of spirituality, said Lawrence, does not depend on changing things, does not depend on changing things you do, but rather changing your motive doing for God what you would otherwise be doing for yourself. Very subtle, isn't it? But very important. You know, the motive inside. One of his eulogies said, the good brother found God everywhere, as much 
while he was repairing shoes as when he was praying. It was God, not the task he had in view. He knew that the more the task was against his natural inclinations, the greater was his love in offering it to God. That sort of rings true with the Garden of Gethsemane and, and whatever it is that you've brought to mind that's the suffering, you know. He knew the, the more the task was against his natural inclinations, the more you want to say, please take this cup from me, God. The greater was his love in offering it to God. The greater was his love in saying, your will be done, not mine. Now I've got to look at my notes because I'm sure I had a lot more to say. Look, I'm near run out of time anyway. I'll, I'll say another thing. I'll say two other things. One is, um, I'm trying to remember where I heard it. I don't know if it was, I reckon, I, I reckon it was that, um, oh, who's that American guy I find hard to listen to? Is that, uh, anyone know that American guy with the constant smile? No, no. Um, doesn't matter. Olstein, Rick Olstein. Is that his name? Is that a, anyway, him. He's always smiling. And I'm pretty sure it was on one of his DVDs. He, he told about a going down a, uh, doing a white water rafting trip down a river in Africa or somewhere. And um, he thought it was a good idea. And they launched their little raft into this nice flat bit of water. They got out from the bank and they discovered there was a dead hippopotamus floating around. And all of a sudden he thought, hmm, this nice bit of water might not let me last too, too long. And they drifted out into the stream, got caught in the current, and they're going down this gorge, flat out down this gorge, bouncing off rocks and things like that. And in that moment, he's thinking, what have I done? <laughs> and he's going, protect me, God, help me, God. And then end of the gorge it comes out onto a flat piece of water again and you can look around and go oh isn't it nice isn't it nice and uh, you know and a series of rapids and and he said isn't that a bit like us with life you know we go down a rapid and we're going you know we get in these crises which force us back to god force us back to say help me god you know we go down and then we get into this nice bit of life where we can enjoy the scenery and get away the trouble is we get complacent don't we so then we get in another rapid. Help me, God. Come on. And then we're not, and we can enjoy it again. Now, I mean, I don't know if that's everybody. That's what happened there. It happens with me. I can identify with that. And um, so when we're in these crises, our little Garden of Gethsemane identification things that we're thinking of, you know, consider it pure joy when you face those trials and tribulations. <laughs> I find that hard. Yeah. <laughs> When you're going down that rapid. Yeah. Now, I'll just, I'll finish. I'll finish with another, a different one. Different one. Thanks, Bruce, for putting me onto these things. This was a different time in the toilet. Aim high. Uh, who wrote this one? Dave Brennan. Don't know who he is. When my daughter and her family were in town for a visit, I had a chance to take my son and two sons-in-laws out for a guy outing. We decided that while the ladies were shopping, we would go to a firing range and practice shooting. We rented two pistols, took aim at our targets, and while we were shooting, all four of us discovered that one of the firearms, the sight was set too low. And if we aimed using that sight, we hit the bottom of the target all the time. We had to aim higher in order to hit anywhere near the bullseye. Isn't life a lot like that? He says. If we set our sights too low, we really don't accomplish all that we can. Sometimes we have to aim high in order to actually reach the desired goal. What should our aim in life be? How should we point out a point our, our how should we point our ambitions? Well, since scripture is our true guide, we will shoot for nothing but spiritual maturity. 
And in fact, Paul's farewell to the people of Corinth, he said, aim for perfection. And we also have to aim high. We, we, and we also have the high aim of these words from the lips of Jesus. You shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. He says, uh, perfection is a lofty target, but we won't attain it, and we won't attain it in this life. But if we want to honour God and guess, get close to that high goal, we need to aim high. And Jesus, I think, in this, par in this passage that I've read today, there's heaps, isn't there, that he's given us to role model him to aim high. He's given us the role model at which to aim for. We won't, we won't get it in this life. But that self-sacrifice, that love, that um, willingness to accept suffering and insult and injury is, is what he's given us to aim at. Thank you.